Our Father and our awesome God, here we are once again, dear Father God, uh, yearning and hungering, dear Father God, for the study of your awesome word, dear Father God. And uh, nothing can fulfill that hunger, dear Father God, except uh, hearing from you, dear Father God. And so uh, feed us, dear Father God, as only you can, dear Father. Uh, we ask if you would please to speak to us plainly and clearly, dear Father God, because we admit uh, that we are just simple people, dear Father God. But you promise, dear Father God, to uh, even give the simple some understanding, dear Father God. So uh, speak to us, Lord. But, uh, make sure that we are sure that it's you, dear Father God. We thank you and we love you. You're a wonderful God. This is why we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning, Bella Vista and online friends. Uh, this is Eric Bingham once again uh, to present to you the spiritual formation class. The spiritual formation class. And remember, we affectionately call this class uh, increasing your favor with God. Because what person does not want to increase in favor with God? There are some people who lie and say that they are blessed and highly favored. But you aren't automatically blessed and highly favored. You find the favor of God by living the way. Uh, that he has commanded us to live. And so that's why this class is designed uh, to teach us the disciplines that should exist in our lives. Because when you place the disciplines in your life uh, that God has designed for you, then that's when your favor with God uh, will increase. And boy, I should get a big amen after that. Uh, but, you know, as we normally do, we start off with a review from last week. And last week we talked about the discipline of service the discipline of service and every follower of Jesus Christ should have the desire to serve God. It's not enough just to believe in God because the Bible said that even the demons believe and do tremble, but they fall short because they have no desire to serve God. But we increase in favor with God when we have the desire and open up to ways to serve God. And so the first thing that we we emphasize was the epitome of servanthood. And when you hear those words, epitome of servanthood, that ought to automatically make you think of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ himself said uh, that he came to serve and not be served, that he might be a ransom for many. And so if our Lord and Savior was a servant, then guess what we need to be? We need to be servants as well. He was such a servant that he got down on his hands and, and washed the disciples' feet, their dirty feet. And if Jesus was willing to do the dirty work, uh, we should be willing uh, to do the dirty work as well. The second point uh, that we press was the everydayness uh, of servanthood. And in that point, uh, what we were pressing was that God uh, accepts even the small things that we do. God is not always looking for us to do great and grand grandiose things. God even acknowledges the small things uh, that we do. Uh, remember that the Bible teaches us that uh, when we stand before the judgment seat of God, the ones who will be called the blessed of God will be those who saw him when he was thirsty and gave him something to drink. Those who saw him when he was hungry gave him something to eat. Those who saw him when he was naked and clothed him sick and visited him and in prison and came to see about him. And so those aren't great grandiose things. Those are small things. And those are the things that God will judge us for uh, in the judgment, not necessarily those great grandiose things. Because those small things are things that we do can do on an everyday basis. And that's why we say that God blesses the everydayness uh, of a servant. And that last point was the e eclipse of a servant, the eclipse of a servant, the same way uh, that the uh, moon sometimes eclipses the sun, uh, we need to uh, have our ways of service eclipsed. In other words, we ought not uh, serve God for the applause of serving God. We ought to serve God just because we love God. 
Remember, the scripture says, not, don't let your left hand uh, know what your right hand is doing. And so I asked the question, do you want to be a left-handed servant or you want to be a right-handed servant? The left-handed servant only cares about doing things to be seen of men, but the right-handed servant is satisfied in knowing that God sees him, El Roi sees you. And so when you are satisfied with El Roi seeing you, with God seeing you, uh, doing the little ways, even the little things that you do to serve him, then the scripture says that you will be blessed uh, in an abundant way. But if you choose to be a left-handed servant and only care about being seen by men, that will be the only reward that you get. And I don't know about you, uh, but the rewards that I desire are the rewards that God has to give. And so our lesson today uh, comes from chapter 10 of our study guide, and that lesson is the discipline of confession. The discipline of confession. And that word confess in the original Greek language means to agree with to agree with, to us specifically, to uh, come into agreement with God. When you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, then you come into agreement with God. But in this chapter, the focus is upon sin. And so in this discipline of confession, what we want to do is come into agreement with God about our sins. The scripture says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so when you confess your sins, then you've come into agreement with God that, yes, Lord, I am one of the ones uh, who have sinned and come short of your glory. And so that's what we want to do as believers in Jesus Christ. We want to come into agreement with God. The Bible says that he who says he has no sin makes him a liar. And so when you confess your sins, you come into agreement with God. But when you fail to acknowledge your sins, wow, it's like calling God a liar. And one of the things we should not want to do is call God a liar. And that's why we confess our sins. And so the very first point that we want to talk about uh, on this day is the Father's willingness to forgive. And so the commentary that I added uh, to that first point says this. It says the first point that the author of our study guide presses is that we serve the God who is willing to forgive us of all of our sin. Doesn't matter what you've done, the God that we serve is willing to forgive us of all of our sins. If God was not willing to forgive us our sins, then the confession of our sins would be worthless. We would live we would die, and then we would all end up in hell. But thanks be to God that he allowed his only begotten son, Jesus, to die upon a cross as his demonstration that he is willing to forgive us of whatever we have done. And so I've given you Luke 23, 33 through 34 in the King James Version, and this is how it reads. It says, and when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, don't just listen to the words. Remember what the scene is. Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross. He just had nails put in his hands, a spike driven through his feet. He's been lifted up high and dropped down low. But these very men who nailed him to the cross, Jesus Christ looked up to the Father and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. There is no other greater demonstration that God is willing to forgive us of our sins than God himself saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Boy, that ought to bring some of us to shame because sometimes we won't even forgive people for the very little things that we do. But Jesus Christ being nailed to a cross said, Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. Uh, Ephesians 1 and 7, and on the handout, you'll see that it's from the NIV version, and it reads this way. It says, in him, in him, only in him, we have redemption through his blood. If Jesus Christ had not shed his blood on Calvary's cross, then we could not be redeemed. We are redeemed in his blood. Now I hear you, somebody saying, well, what does that really mean? Redeemed in his blood. And sometimes you get your answer from scriptures by continuing to read. And the rest of that verse says, we have redemption through his blood. And here it is, the forgiveness of of sins being redeemed in his blood means that you have been forgiven of your sins and it's in the accordance with the riches of God's grace because God is rich in gracefulness then we have been forgiven of our sins but it only comes through the redemption that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ and so first Timothy 1 Verses 12 through 13, and I love the way it reads in the New Living Translation, says this. It says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. This is the Apostle Paul talking. He's thanking God for the strength to do his work. He goes on to say, he considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. As believers in Jesus Christ, we've been appointed to serve God, not just to believe in God, but to also serve God. The believer's relationship with God ought to go through a transition. And so once you acknowledge your belief in him, the next step in that transition is to learn from him. And then after you learn from him, the desire should be to serve him. That verse 13 in 1 Timothy chapter 1 says that even though I used to bless Blasphemed the name of Christ. The apostle Paul, the great apostle Paul, is acknowledging that he was guilty of blaspheming the name of Jesus Christ. But he says, in my insolence, I persecuted his people. He specifically acknowledges what he did. And so when we confess our sins, we are responsible for specifically acknowledging what you've done. Anybody can say, Father, forgive me of my sins. But every now and then, you need to be specific with God with what you've done. You need to show God that you understand that what you've done does not line up with his word. So you've got to say what you've done. The apostle Paul said, I used to blaspheme the name of Christ because I persecuted his people. But then he says, but God, and we ought to love those two words together. But God, to me, those are two of the greatest words together other than Jesus Christ. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Once again, we see the Apostle Paul uh, acknowledging that he was forgiving because what he do did was in ignorance and unbelief. And I know a lot of you guys, when you hear that word blaspheme, because that's what the Apostle Paul said he did, he blaspheme against the name of Christ, where you're asking yourself, well, isn't blasphemy the unforgivable sin? Isn't blasphemy against the Holy Spirit uh, uh, an unforgivable sin? And why can the Apostle Paul say it, that God showed him mercy and forgave him? Well, this might help you to have a greater understanding of what it means to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit because when we place that with what Jesus Christ said Jesus Christ said on the cross father forgive them why for they know not what they do and the apostle Paul said that even though he persecuted the people of God he also said that he did it in ignorance and unbelief and so now we see what happens uh, when we sin and are forgiven is through that forgiveness and unbelief but one of the things that why blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is unforgivable because the Holy Spirit is what leads us and guides us into the truth and so once a person comes to the realization 
of what Jesus, who Jesus Christ is and what he means to us as a people. And they reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's no longer out of disbelief and ignorance, but now the truth has been rejected of who Jesus Christ is. And now you're guilty of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And if you die, never accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then that becomes the unforgivable sin. And so I hope in my little muddled way I was able to help you with that. Uh, but study it for yourself and come to an even greater understanding. And so in the takeaway for that first section, we have that we should praise and thank God for his willingness to forgive us of not just some of our sins, but all of our sins, some of the greatest people of the Bible were all guilty of some type of sin. But God forgave them when they were willing to humble themselves before him and begin to accept his leadership in their lives. And they became great men and women of God simply because God is the forgiver of all sins. And so second section that we want to look at on on today is the faithfulness the faithfuls the faithfuls willingness to confess those who claim themselves to be faithful in Jesus Christ ought to always be willing to accept their sins and uh, I mean to confess their sins and so the commentary that goes with that reads this way it says even though God is willing to forgive our sins we have to confess that we have sins that need to be forgiven. Yes, God is willing to forgive, but you have to open your mouth and confess that you have sins that need to be forgiven. The rest of that commentary says that when we confess our sins, not if you confess your sins, but when you confess your sins, then we are acknowledging and agreeing with God that we have sins that need to be forgiven. And if the scripture says that all have come a sin and come short of the glory of God, that means that we all have something to confess. And so for your reading pleasure, I've given you Luke 18, 9 through 14. And when you look up that scripture, uh, you'll find out it's a, a parable that is being told about a Pharisee and a publican that went into the temple to pray. And when you look at the prayer of the Pharisee, you'll see that the Pharisee made two grave mistakes. The first mistake that he made in his prayer was to compare himself to other people. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we don't compare ourselves to other people. You can always find somebody that you're doing something better than. But people are not the standard. Jesus Christ is the standard. And that's why we all have sinned and come short of his glory because we do not reach the standard of perfection which is found in Jesus Christ. And so that first mistake that that Pharisee made was to compare himself to other people. The second mistake that he made was he started bragging on himself, talking about all the wonderful things uh, that he has done. But the thing we have to remember is that I don't care how wonderful you think the things are that you have done, our righteousness is still as filthy rags. And so even though we can do some wonderful things in the sight of man, that those things aren't necessarily wonderful in the sight of God. And so we don't necessarily brag on those things, but we do thank God for the opportunity to do those things. And so when you look at the publican's prayer, the publican says two things as well. Well, actually three. He says, God have mercy on me because I am a sinner. He acknowledges God. He acknowledges Theos as the one and only superior God of the universe. And he says, have mercy on me because he knows that mercy of God or, or from God is the only place that we can truly receive mercy. And then he acknowledges himself as a sinner. 
And after Jesus Christ tells the parable, he says that it was the publican or the tax collector who was the one who was justified in the sight of God because he was willing to humble himself before God. And, and those who humble themselves before God are those who are uh, exalted. But those who exalt themselves before God by comparing themselves to other people and always talking about the wonderful things that they have done. Look at my resume. Look at all the great things that I've done uh, for God. But the Bible says that those who exalt themselves will be the ones that have been humbled. So just like the publican, or in other words, the tax collector, what we want to do is come before God and say, God, have mercy on me because I am a sinner. First uh, John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, boy, and it's a sad connotation for that verse to say if, because the believer in Jesus Christ ought to always be willing to confess their sins. But this is why it says if. It says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And so there are stipulations upon receiving the forgiveness of God because then that stipulation is that you need to confess the things that you have done. But whenever I talk about 1 John 1 and 9, I always tell people, don't forget to read the rest of that verse because the rest of that verse says, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so I believe that the believer's real motivation for confessing their sins is because they have a desire to be cleansed from their sins. You've come into agreement with God about your sins. You do not, no longer want that junk on the inside of you. You no longer want the potential to sin on the inside of you. And so you go to God to confess your sins, not just to be forgiven, but to also have him to cleanse you of that unrighteousness that is within you. And we all have some unrighteousness that is within us, but your desire should be to be cleansed from it. And so Romans, 7, Romans chapter 7, 24 through 25, which is another scripture written by the apostle Paul. This is what the apostle Paul says. Oh, wretched man that I am. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a man who God used to write a half of the scriptures that we have in the New Testament. But yet and still, this great man of God, who God used in a mighty way, said, oh, wretched man that I am. And when I think about that, I think about that God hadn't used me to write not a single word of the scriptures. And so if this man who wrote a half of the New Testament declares that he's a wretch, and a wretch undone, then guess what I can only do? I can only acknowledge that I am a wretch as well. But that scripture goes on to say, he, and pa the apostle Paul cries out, who will deliver me from this body of death? He wasn't satisfied with his wretchedness. He wasn't comfortable with his wretchedness. He wanted to be delivered from his wretchedness. Remember, I told you, when we confess our sins, one of our motivations should be to be cleansed from the unrighteousness. And here the apostle Paul is crying out, who will deliver me from this body of death? But in the rest of that scripture, he answers his own question. And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm in this battle within myself. The greatest battles in this world aren't on the outside of you. The greatest battles in this world are on the inside of you. And the only way we can win those battles on the inside of us, the battle of our mind to do what's right versus the flesh to do everything that's sinful, then we have to go to God and ask him for help. Boy, and every time I think about that, I, I'm reminded uh, of what one of my uncles said, and I've said this before, uh, that he said, uh, nephew, when, after I clean myself up a little bit, uh, I'm going to begin to come to church. And I told him, I said, well, uncle, I guess you're never coming. Uh, because we don't clean ourselves up. 
God cleans us up. But we have to have the desire to confess to God that we want to be cleaned up. And when we cry out to be cleansed by God, then God will clean us up. But you first have to confess that you are a sinner. And so uh, in the takeaway for that second section, and it's a bit of a lengthy one, this is what it says. It says, we are justified in the sight of God when we are open and willing to confess our own sin. We, good at, we real good at seeing the sin and acknowledging the sins of others, but how good are you at acknowledging your own sins? The rest of that commentary said that not only should you be willing to confess your own sins, you have to desire to be cleansed from your sins and acknowledge that deliverance from sin only comes through Jesus Christ. The only person who can deliver you from your sins is Jesus Christ himself. And I couldn't help but add an extra footnote to that takeaway. And the footnote says this, God ultimately wants to deliver us from all sin. And when I wrote that, the scripture that I had in mind was Revelation chapter 20 and 21. And when you go to the end of Revelation chapter 20, you'll see that ultimately God takes the devil, casts him into the lake of fire. He takes the beasts and the false prophets, casts them into the lake of fire, and all those who follow him will be cast into the lake of fire. And so ultimately, God is going to eradicate this world of all evil. And when you go over into Revelation chapter 21, you see that that's when God creates the new heaven and the new earth. And we see the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And so this earth is made new when God eradicates all evil out of this world. And so I had to close that take out by saying this, our desire to be cleansed from all sin demonstrates our desire to live in the new heaven and the new earth where there will be no sin. And so if it's not your desire to have all sin eradicated out of your life, then it's just like telling God that I have no desire to live in the new heaven and the new earth. Wow goes right there. And so the last point that I want to press on today is the faithful's right perspective of sin as the faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And knowing I'm saying followers of Jesus Christ, we follow the example of Jesus Christ. We don't just acknowledge knowledge Jesus Christ, but we follow his examples. And so as faithful followers of Jesus Christ, we have to have the right perspective of sin. And so the commentary that goes along with that section says, the author of our study guide states that we need to become confidants for those who confess their sins to us. Every now and then, somebody uh, may want to use you as a sounding board, they may want to use you to talk about their own sins, and that's completely biblical because in James 5, verses 13 through 16, you'll see that uh, the scriptures say, confess your sins one to another. And one of the things that I think we overlook is that, that scripture where you find that says, confess your sins one to another, it exists in the context of the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous. And so within the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous, you find that we need to confess our sins. And it's through the confession of sins where the effectual, fervent prayer includes the desire to be forgiven and cleansed from your sin. If, the, if there is no part in the prayer that uh, has a desire to be cleansed from your sin, then it's not an effectual and fervent prayer. And then in the book of James, this says, so that you may be healed. Because sometimes some of the uh, illnesses that we have are due to our sins. David said that even his very bones ached when he failed to confess his sins. And so sometimes some of the aches and pains that we feel are because you failed to confess your sins. Get that out of you. <laughs>
And that's when the healing process begins. Not just the physical cleansing, but the spiritual cleansing as well. The spiritual cleansing is far more important than the physical healing. And so the rest of that commentary says to become confidence as it confidants as it relates to somebody else's sin you need to have the right perspective on sin and the right perspective on sin is that there is no sin that's greater than any other sin have you ever had somebody come to you and and you've uh had a conversation about something that they've done wrong but then they want to say how dare you try to compare what what i've done based on all the stuff that you've done. Wrong perspective. It doesn't matter what the sin is. There are no comparatives to sin. Sin is sin. And if you are guilty of any sin, then you're wrong in the sight of God. And so James 2, 9 through 10 in the NIV says, but if you show favoritism, and that's what we do when when, when we fail to look at our sins or somebody else's sins as nothing as compared to somebody else's sin. We're showing favoritism. And so that scripture says, but if you show favoritism, guess what you do? You sin and are convicted by the law as transgressions. So no matter what your sin is, you have violated the laws of God, and you are just as guilty no matter what your sin is compared to somebody else's. That verse 10 says, whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking them all. So the second you committed your first sin, you are guilty of breaking the whole law. And so when we look at Exodus 21 through 17, which is another one of my favorite examples, uh, this is where Moses gives us the Ten Commandments. And within those Ten Commandments, we see that the scripture says, don't lie. And then it says, do not murder. Another wow ought to go right there. Because in the same Ten Commandments where God says, do not murder, he also says, do not lie. And so the liar in the sight of God is a sinner just like the murderer is. And so the day you told your very first lie, you were just as guilty as the one who has committed, uh, committed murder. And so a sin is a sin in the sight of God. Uh, Romans 6 uh, and 23 says that the wages of sin is death. And so no matter what sin you've committed, guess what the penalty is? The penalty is death. The penalty for the liar is death. The penalty for the murderer is death. The penalty for the covetant for those who have coveted is death. The penalty for the adulterer is death. It does not matter the sin that you've committed. The penalty is still the same, but God does not leave us hanging there. He says, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so God wants to exchange the penalty of your sins for the gift that he has for you. And that gift is eternal life Through Jesus Christ. And so thanks be to God once again, no matter what your sin has has been, God has an exchange program for you. He wants to exchange the penalty for your sins for the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important that we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because it's only through him that we have redemption from our sins, and it's only through him that we receive the gift of eternal life because he paid the wage for your sins in full on Calvary's cross, and God says, I'm willing to make the exchange. And so in the takeaway for that section, it says to be confident as it relates to the sin of others, or let me say that again because I keep saying that wrong, to be a confidant as it relates to the sin of others, then we need to have a biblical 
perspective of sin. And let me clarify what a confidant is. That means to keep it secret, to keep it to yourself. Somebody ought to be able to confess a sin to you and you ought to be willing to keep it to yourself. The only uh, discussion that should be had about somebody else's sin should be to God when you pray to God to help them realizing that there was a time when you needed help with your sins yourself. And just like you needed help with your sin, let me say that better or more rightly, we need help with our sins because we never stop needing help with our sins. You need help with your sin. And so, therefore, if you need help with your sin, you ought to want God to be a help to others who have been willing to openly confess their sins as well. And, wow, I know that this has been one of those uh, lessons today uh, where, uh, like Pastor Abraham used to say, if you can't say amen, say ouch. Uh, but I like to say sometimes you have say amen and ouch uh, because whatever God says in his word is true and sometimes you have to say ouch because it hits you really hard, really hard but even though uh, we have to say ouch sometimes to some of the things that God has said to us in his word the Bible also says that there is a bomb in Gilead and so God is willing to soothe those pains as long as you're willing to give up on your sins and turn your face back to him so that you can begin to live the way that he would have you to live. But it begins with the willingness of opening your mouth and confessing that you are a sinner and you desire for God to cleanse you from all your sins. Well, that's the end of my little old lesson on today. And so, uh, as it says at the bottom of the handout, uh, you can reach out to me with any type of questions, uh, ebingham at bellavistambc.org. And so, uh, our lesson for next week uh, will be the discipline of worship. The discipline of worship. Even sometimes we think we're pretty familiar with a topic. There's always a little jewel uh, for us to learn. Uh, I've been teaching and preaching the word of God uh, for a combination of over 30 years, and I'm still learning little jewels from God. My understanding is getting better and better. Uh, so don't think that you know everything about worship because there may be some little jewel that you can pick up. And so God bless you and keep you is my prayer uh, for you today. See you on next week.